Charles Darwin. Everybody knows his name and most of us have a pretty good idea why. Back in the mid 19th century, he told the world about his revolutionary idea that all species on Earth are related and have somehow transformed over time thanks to natural selection in a competitive world. But who was he really? And what did it take to become a legend of modern science? I've come to University Museum of Zoology here in Cambridge, which houses a whole host of amazing specimens collected by Charles Darwin himself. And I'm going to meet a team of experts to find out a whole lot more. So these are Darwin's beetles. Oh my goodness me. <gasps> They're not even covered. <laughs> Darwin was very interested in entomology and beetles in particular and collected them almost obsessively in his days here as a student. When he was at Cambridge, he wasn't studying entomology? Not specifically, no. It was a hobby, but it sort of established his credentials as a naturalist and he was well known as someone who was interested in this sort of thing. So who was he talking to? Who was so, he swapping beetles with? One of the most important people was Leonard Jennings, who was one of the best naturalists of his day. It was actually in uh, 1846, in a letter to Jennings, that he described some of his early beetle collecting exploits. So he was out collecting um, beetles, and he already had a beetle in each hand. And he saw this then very rare species of beetle called Panagaeus crux major. Um, and in his attempt to pick that up as well, he put one of the beetles he already had in his mouth. <laughs> tried to catch the Panagaeus, but the beetle he picked up was a, a, a bombardier beetle, which then squirted him with some noxious fluid, and uh, he then dropped them all and lost them. So he lost so all three? Lost all three. <laughs> but I love that story because it tells us so much about um, his obsession with collecting mm -hmm. at the time. So he eventually got some. The rare Panagaeus crux major that he was trying to catch is this beetle here, and you can see it's got uh, this orange markings, but you see the black cross. Mm -hmm. So it's known as the Christmas right. ground beetle, and it's still a very rare species at the moment. I'm not surprised he like struggled to catch those because they're so tiny. You have got to be a very keen collector and, and a bit obsessive to want to do this because some of these beetles are minute. Absolutely. Mm. Tiny wow. things. From these obsessive beginnings, Charles Darwin's career as a natural scientist truly began when he boarded the HMS Beagle. Darwin was on the Beagle for five years. How did yeah. he come to be there in the first place? So he wasn't the first choice to go on the Beagle voyage. It was Henslow who was contacted initially, who thought about it, but decided not to because of family commitment. And then he suggested Leonard Jennings. Jennings turned it down, but the two of them suggested Darwin would be a very affable character on the Beagle voyage. So it wasn't yeah. necessarily his expertise that got him onto the boat, actually. It no. was the fact he was just a fun guy. He was a fun guy, he was friendly, he seemed like the right kind of person to be a gentleman companion. So how did he go about collecting specimens on the voyage? I think he got extremely excited and he collected an awful lot. And he described spending a lot of time down at the tidal pools and um, collecting the animals that he saw there. He describes it as being like a blind man who's just been given eyes and he's overwhelmed by wow. everything that he can see. I've just got these great visions of Darwin just bouncing around the rock pools trying to collect yeah. everything <laughs> in sight. And yeah. this is one of the specimens here. This is actually two of the specimens in this oh. jar. On the 28th of January in 1832, so this is about three or four weeks after setting off on the Beagle, he describes seeing an octopus specimen on the Cape Verde Islands uh, that changes colour just like a chameleon. And his mind is blown by his this. Mind, his mind is blown by this. He thinks this is a brand new observation I've seen this for the first time. And he sends this description to Henslow. And Henslow, his mentor here at Cambridge, sends a lovely letter back saying, you know, it's a really, really great observation. It's not new, but keep going. Oh, and like a pat uh, on the back. You're, like doing a a really... You're doing a good job, but uh, <laughs> it's not a new observation. During his five years aboard the HMS Beagle, Darwin collected thousands of specimens some of which he didn't come to fully understand till years later. So what we have here are finches collected on the Beagle voyage. And I choose my words very carefully there. Yes. These finches weren't actually collected by Darwin himself. These were actually collected by Harry Fuller, who was Captain Fitzroy's assistant. So these are Darwin's finches, he just didn't collect them himself. Exactly, we often call Darwin's finches. They're sort of the poster child for evolution, if you like. We've all heard the story about how different finches on different islands had different beak shapes, and that yeah. relates to how they fared, and that, that informed Darwin uh, about the theory of evolution. Can I hold one? 
I suppose. Oh my goodness me. Wow, wow. I, oh, that this. You're I feel very, history. very honoured to be holding one of Diamond Kind of Finches. That is absolutely amazing. But I'd like to move on actually from <laughs> birds to eggs. So back in 2009, we were all celebrating the, I hope you were as well, the bicentenary of Darwin's birth, yeah. which was February the 12th. Uh, yeah. Of course you knew that, 2009. Yeah, I did a um, party. We had a party, yeah. so did we. <laughs> uh, the next day was Friday the 13th, which was actually for us quite a lucky day. One of our volunteers, a lovely lady called Liz, she uncovered an egg with C. Darwin written on it. And we found this little chocolate brown egg. It does look like chocolate. <laughs> yep. <laughs> so, what is this? Whose egg is it? <laughs> well, for all we knew, it was an egg collected by Charles Darwin at any time in his life. But this passage here tells it all. So, uh, Charles Darwin by me. So that tells us that it's not Darwin's signature, unfortunately. It would have been nice. Um, one egg received through Frank Darwin, Darwin's son, uh, having been sent to me by his father, who said he got it at Maldonado. Charles Darwin had only left the UK once, and that was for the Beagle Voyage. That instantly told us that this was a Beagle Voyage specimen, and that it belonged to the common Tinamou of these parts. This is the best bit. Yeah. You'll notice there's a great big crack running down that egg. Yes, it's fairly obvious. <laughs> now, that egg had been rattling around in a reserve collection for at least 140 years, and my immediate concern as a collections manager was, oh dear, perhaps we've broke it. But Newton cleared us. The great man put it into too small a box and hence it's in happy state. I love that. There's a slight tone, isn't there? There's a subtext to that. There I can the blame end. Darwin. The great man put it in a too small a box. Exactly. Even after returning to England, Charles was still a relatively inexperienced young scientist and still had a lot of work to do to really prove himself. What am I looking at? <laughs> so here we have microscope slides that were prepared by Darwin, all of barnacles. And he wrote um, four volumes in total about barnacles. Barnacles? Barnacles, yeah. That's really bizarre to me. <laughs> because, yeah. I mean, I've heard about Darwin's finches and other specimens, but I've never heard he was really into barnacles. Yeah, so barnacles um, are quite unusual. Most of them, they cement what is essentially their head to the rock that they're attached to, and then they wave their uh, legs around in the seawater to collect food. And they didn't even know exactly where barnacles fit in the animal kingdom at the time. Were they okay. worms? Were they mollusks? Were they crustaceans? What was the outcome? What did he decide? The outcome, and it is what we still follow today, is that they're crustaceans. They are crustaceans. So they're related to crabs and lobsters and things like that. Okay. Yeah. So four volumes, that's a lot of yeah. work. How long did that, did that take him? Well, he started in 1846 mm -hmm. and completed it in 1854. So eight years. Eight years yeah. on barnacles. Why do you think he felt the need, or why did he want to go into such an in-depth study of barnacles? Uh, well, there are a few uh, conflicting ideas about it. One mm. is that um, he really wanted to prove himself as a zoologist, yeah. showing that he was uh, a scientist and, like I say, having that kind of respect, possibly before publishing the ideas that he already had about evolution. Ah, okay, so on one hand, it just goes to show actually how much detailed research is needed to get to the bottom of something. Yeah but it's possible he might have just been stalling for time. Possible, yeah. So he, there are notes and letters uh, to friends where he points that, yeah, this is a controversial idea. I'm sure I'll, I'll lose face in, with my scientific peers. So he kind of knows what his fate is. Yeah, yeah. And he's just building up the courage or wanting to make sure that when he finally right. does put that message out there, he's credible. Yes, yeah, I think that was a very important thing to him. So this great man, a household name, was human, capable of breaking eggs and putting things in his mouth that he probably shouldn't have, and even putting off a seemingly nasty job, the announcement of a revolutionary theory that eventually turned him into the legend. We've got lots more videos about the natural world here at Earth Unplugged, so make sure you give this video a like, subscribe, and click on that bell icon to get notified every time we upload a new video. We'll see you soon.